Hello, I'm Alison Young, and this is another in the series of looking at controversial constitutional cases from the Constitutional Law Matters Project. And this time we're going to be looking at a case called Unison. So this is R. Unison and Lord Chancellor, and it's another decision of the UK Supreme Court. So why is this decision of constitutional importance and why does it cause so many problems? Well, this is one of the key cases applying a principle that we call the principle of legality. And this is all about how should courts interpret legislation when the legislation seems to restrict or interfere with in some way some fundamental principles of the common law. And some see this as a general principle of statutory interpretation. So it's just about how courts go away and interpret legislation. And other commentators say it's something more than that. It's not just about how we interpret legislation. It has key importance as a principle of the UK Constitution because it's one of the main ways in which we can uphold the rule of law. And this argument is used in particular when courts are interpreting legislation that give broad powers to the executive to go away and bring in regulations, for example, which as you'll see, is what was happening in this case, in the Unison case itself. And just like most things in the UK Constitution, this seems to give rise to a conflict between the rule of law and parliamentary sovereignty. Because these fundamental principles of the common law are substantive principles that we see as being protected because they're important, they're part of the rule of law. They're all about guaranteeing, for example, access to judicial review or guaranteeing rights to vote or guaranteeing uh, fundamental common law rights in some way. And this conflicts with parliamentary sovereignty. If Parliament has given broad words, would they really want courts to reinterpret these words in line with these background fundamental principles? Or could we equally argue, well, when Parliament enacts legislation, it must know that there are these fundamental principles of the common law in the background. So, of course, we can assume that Parliament would want its legislation to be interpreted in line with these principles. So there's this tension between the will of Parliament, expressed as part of parliamentary sovereignty, and the rule of law, this idea of protecting fundamental substantive rights or procedural rights as fundamental principles of the common law. And as with all things in the Constitution, there's a big importance about context. And here there are two issues you'll see running through this case. On the one hand, this is all about access to courts. So it's very important from a rule of law perspective to make sure individuals can get to the court. But on the other hand, this is all about socio-economic decisions. And we tend to think that it's much better for Parliament to take these decisions as they are accountable for the way in which they balance different interests. So having set that context and understanding why this case is important, what was the case specifically about? Well, this is all about a particular provision in the tribunal's courts and Enforcement Act of 2007, and I've put the provision section 42 on the slide for you. And what you can see is this gives a very broad general power to the Lord Chancellor. So the Lord Chancellor may by order, so enacting delegated legislation, set the amount of fees you pay in certain courts and tribunals, and also work out whether you get exemption, reduction or remission from these fees. And the Lord Chancellor used this general power to decide the level of fees that would be paid for the Employment Appeal Tribunal, which was within the definition of an added tribunal. And the argument was made that these fees were so high and the level of income you had to earn to get remission from the fees was also so low that in essence it just was making it practically impossible for people to get to the Employment Appeal Tribunal and so the argument was we had to read down this power because it was interfering with a fundamental common law right. So that was the argument. But what did the Supreme Court decide? Well, the Supreme Court agreed and it stressed the importance of the rule of law and in particular of ensuring access to the court and to tribunals. There's no point in having rights if you can't get to a court or a tribunal to enforce them when they've been restricted and get the appropriate remedy for that harm or restriction of your rights. And so the court stressed that there was a constitutional 
constitutional right of unimpeded access to the courts. And here we had a look at the particular wording of legislation and applied the principle of legality. So the court had to say, well, we've got general words here, but we have to look carefully does, are there specific words in the legislation that would empower the Lord Chancellor to set fees at such a rate that it would impede the right of access to the courts and make it practically impossible? Well, here, no, there wasn't. There was just general wording. There was nothing specific saying that you could undermine the right of access to the courts. And also, Lord Reed, when he gave his judgment, added that even if you do have specific wording in the legislation that might impede power the Lord Chancellor to set fees that might intrude on the right of access to the courts, any intrusion has to be something that is reasonably necessary to achieve the purpose of that particular order. Now, we didn't need to apply that in this case because there wasn't the specific wording. So, because the Lord Chancellor had not been empowered specifically to do something that would impede access to the courts, the court concluded that the Lord Chancellor did not have the power to set the fees at such a high rate combined with the low level of income that you needed to earn to get remission from the fees such that it was making it practically impossible to get to court. So why is this case problematic? Well, there are general and specific criticisms. The general criticism is all about the principle of legality and this argument that this contradicts the will of Parliament. Now, you can see why people might think that because the Lord Chancellor might say, well, I was given a general power. How was I to know that I'm not supposed to use this power in such a way that would make it practically impossible to come to the tribunal and therefore I'd be impeding access to the courts? Well, the other argument is to say, well, there are these long-standing principles. Parliament is aware of them. And so we can assume that if Parliament wanted to undermine these principles, then it would do so by setting up very clear, specific, precise wording. So it's not actually contradicting the will of Parliament. It's just saying we want to make sure that this is what Parliament really intended to do, because we'll assume that Parliament doesn't want to undermine rights. So we'll have to look carefully for very specific, clear and precise wording. So we know there really has been a democratic check on this power and a democratic mandate to act in a way that might undermine these fundamental principles of the common law. And this brings us to the second principle, because it's all very well saying there are these fundamental principles of the common law, but where do they come from? And the argument in favour of them will say, well, they come from common law case law. It's been around for a very long time. We all know what these principles are. They'll evolve slowly over time, building on past cases. And so it's easy to find them and we can more or less know what they are. But the critics of the principle of legality will say, but you can't give me a complete coherent list. So this creates legal uncertainty. How do we know when the courts will say this is a particular fundamental principle of the common law? It might not be easy to predict and that might undermine the rule of law in a different way. You might not understand what legislation really means if the court comes along and interprets it in a different way. And this case is also specifically criticised. And the argument is it was interfering with policy choices in some way, essentially saying you can have measures to tackle austerity, but not if it's going to undermine the courts. Well, I can see where that argument is coming from, but we have to understand just how important this principle is. And it's back to our understanding of the nature of the UK's constitution. There is this balance between having parliamentary sovereignty, but also recognising that we need to protect judicial review and we need to protect the ability of individuals to go to court to protect their rights. So I can understand why people might think this might interfere with policy choices and difficult decisions we need to make in times of austerity, but I think we need to put it in its specific context, recognising that as far as the UK constitution is concerned, getting to court is important and we need that to balance parliamentary sovereignty. Thank you very much for listening.